Floyd. Floyd. I'll knock you out. You sick. You got it. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ryan and Oscar and all those guys are going to want an easier fight, and that's Roly. So if they can get Roly, then they're going to go with Roly. But if they can't, they might fight Devin. You know, and everyone tries to put Devin Haney down. You get this bullshit stuff from people like Leonard Ellaby saying the fight did 50,000 buys. It ain't even worth responding to. But they want to set a narrative to try and dress it up that actually Devin hasn't got any value. He doesn't really, uh, you know, he doesn't sell pay-per-views. He doesn't sell tickets. And then all of a sudden he sells out the Chase Centre. And they say, yeah, but tickets are only 60 bucks up the top. Who gives a fuck? Like, you know, you should be embracing fights like that, not trying to put people down and talk yourself out of it. It's a stout observation that in this day and age, what some fighters and their teams like to do to get out of fighting in difficult fights is talk down the other fighter's value, their marquee value, as if to say there's no reason to do it, they don't bring anything to the table just to end up fighting someone who's lesser known or less accomplished. When you consider the names that are in the running for a Gervonta Davis fight, for example, you're talking about Ryo, you're talking about Isaac Cruz, what, because these guys have more marquee value than Devin? Huh? Are they even headlining their own shows? Because we know they're nowhere near as accomplished. Devin was undisputed at the same weight that they campaign, and currently he's a two-division champion. He just won a belt at another weight. The strategy, you're gonna talk him down, but talk them up. Talk down guys like Lomachenko, talk down guys like Teofimo Lopez, George Camposo, Stephen Haney, Shakur Stevenson, talk them down. But talk up guys like Isaac, talk up guys like Roly, Roly Romero. People at Golden Boy Promotions are trying to corner a fight with current reigning WBA champion Roly Romero. To that, Eddie Hearn stated that Ryan and Oscar and all those guys, they want an easier fight, and that's Roly. An easier fight than Devin Haney. Could Romero be an easy fight for Ryan? I do think that's an easier fight for Ryan than Devin Haney would be. I do think that's a more winnable fight for Ryan than Devin Haney would be. I could see Ryan walking him into a straight right hand or a check left hook. A counter left hook that could take him out. I think both Ryan and Roley are mediocre. Which makes it the most sensible fight to make for the both of them. I don't think Ryan or Roley are on the level of Devin Haney or Shakur Stevenson or Teofimo Lopez or even Gervonta Davis. No, they're not on his level because he knocked them both out. Those are the kinds of opponents that are right up his alley. Mediocre guys. Now, as far as Roley, who skipped out on satisfying his mandatory challenger, O'Hara Davies, because he's supposedly injured, Roley says, I'm just enjoying my vacations. I don't give a fuck about getting back in the ring anytime soon. This is how Roley Romero, the quote unquote champion, and the WBA jointly, who has so crowned him a champion, make a mockery of the sport to where it doesn't even seem like a sport. In some instances, it's not a sport at all. This guy should have got stripped. May as well have given him an indeterminate amount of time to hang on to that WBA title with a mandatory challenger in the queue while he gloats that he's not fighting, he doesn't know when he's going to fight. And he doesn't care because he doesn't plan on fighting anytime soon. Huh? And this is the American boxing scene. What passes for a champion, a super lightweight champion in America, Roly Romero. People at Golden Boy Promotions want to corner a fight with him for their fighter, their Golden Boy, Ryan Garcia. And I could see the WBA allowing that to happen in spite of O'Hara Davies, rather the winner of O'Hara Davies versus Ishmael Barroso, which I believe has been rescheduled for the undercard of Virgil Ortiz's next fight early next year. Irrespective of the winner of that fight having a claim to challenge Roley, I could see the WBA allowing him to defend the title against Ryan, even though Ryan isn't his mandatory challenger. It's what they've wanted all along. Ryan Garcia, who is experimenting with a new trainer, new style. Roly Romero, who is an experiment, seems to be a lab experiment, gone wrong, a joke that just isn't funny. Pretty much. Ryan, it's the most winnable fight against the champion, the Romero fight, and for Romero, for Roly, it's the biggest money fight he can have outside of a Gervonta Davis fight. The only caveat is, where does it happen? Who distributes it? Because Ryan is a bigger name than Roly Romero. Ryan moves the needle in a way that Roly does not, but Roly is the defending champion. It's Roly's belt 
that Ryan is after, and that at least gives him some leverage in the situation. He's not the A side to Ryan. They've got to work it out. Roley can wait for the winner of O'Hara Davies versus Ishmael Barroso to emerge, but when they do, they're gonna have a claim towards his belt. So he can do what he's gotta do to fight Ryan, if he can fight Ryan, or he can wait for the winner of that fight to come a knocker. He's on borrowed time, and he's gonna have to make a decision. Future, but have you started to speak with your team about what will happen next year, what fights you want? There's one obvious one, but away from Baturbiev, have you spoken with your team now how 2024 will look? Uh, of course, uh, we spoke, and uh, one of uh, when we signed this contract for this fight, it was not only this fight, it's uh, next fight uh, could be for, for belts. And uh, Saudi Arabia is interested to make this fight uh, happen in light heavyweight division. This is why we were here, and uh, this is why I'm excited uh, to be part of this event because it's opened mm, the way for me for the future. The next fight then being signed, um, depending on what happens with Arta Betabiev and Callum Smith. Does it depend on who wins that fight if it takes place in Saudi Arabia? It's uh, I, I'm not sure it's... Uh, uh, you know, it, it depends on... I think it depends on Saudi more, yeah? But now I'm... To be honest, I'm focused now on Lyndon Arthur. And then, uh, I think, yeah, they're interested, of course, to to make the fight happen. Yeah, undisputed fight. Of course, we talk about bitter beef. Yeah, uh, things could be changed. It could be, uh, yeah, uh, Smith. But uh, yeah, I think they will be interested too. Uh, about the fight, Smith and bitter beef. I told before that I'm giving more credits to bitter beef, but we see. What do you think happens between Betabiev and Callum Smith? A lot of people think maybe Arta started started to show his age now. He's maybe a little bit on the decline. Yeah, of course, uh, this is boxing. Everything could happen. And uh, year by year, we are not getting younger. <laughs> and uh, But still, uh, we, we see on boxing styles, um, if we... If we see on Callum Smith boxing style, he he letting his opponent to come too close, but he's tall, but he's letting them to come close, and for Better Beef, he likes it. Who would you rather face, Better Beef or Smith? To be honest, doesn't matter for me. I just uh, think about uh, belts. Even this fight, I I didn't think too much about which person against me. I thought about. Uh, who's better for ranking and who has and he had belt and it was uh, mm, excited for me if you've been following this channel the last year and a half or so you will have heard me say that perhaps the last hope to do Dimitri Bivol versus Artur Better Beef as a fight lies in Saudi because unfortunately here in America Two Russian nationals, two Russian champions, even if it is for undisputed, it's not going to draw but so much here in America, in Canada, or the United Kingdom. But in Saudi, they may have the money to make the fight happen, to satisfy the financial demands for both teams. And it would seem that time has proven me right. Now, there is one last hurdle, really two, but not many view Dimitri Bivol's upcoming fight this weekend against Lyndon Arthur. Not many view that as a dicey situation whereas Artur Betterbeef's next fight is a bit more spicy against former WBA Ring Magazine champion Callum Smith who doesn't have Artur's reputation as a knockout merchant but he has knocked did knock out the last two guys that he fought could he knock out Artur the same way he knocked out Lennon Castillo the same way that he knocked out Matthew Outer league. That's the question. Even though Dimitri Bivol likes to give a lot of neutral and generic answers, it still kind of felt like he was leaning towards Artur to win the match when he said that even though Callum Smith is very tall and very long, 
He seems to let guys get close to him, guys like John Ryder, guys like Canelo Alvarez, and it just so happens Artur, he's a close quarters fighter. He likes to get close to guys, he's a pressure fighter, a volume puncher. So without saying he's favoring Artur to win, it sounds like that's what he was saying, and that sounds like what I've been thinking, that even though Callum Smith is a destructive puncher in his own right, at least he has been as a light heavyweight, if you let Artur get close to you, the way you let John Ryder get close to you, the way you let Canelo get close to you, this guy cracks a lot harder than those guys do. If you let him get close to you, you're gonna lose. But what if he wins? Huh? What if he shocks the world? and knocks out Artur better be than truth, I don't think that would be a hindrance to the undisputed title fight with Dimitri because that's still the biggest fight you can hope to make for the biggest money. And I'm sure that Callum would like to get his hands on some of that Saudi money just as much as Artur and just as much as Dimitri, money being the great motivator and the one language that everybody speaks. When money talks, people listen. So I don't think Callum winning would be a problem. For the right price, I'm sure that the Saudis could get him out there. The real question is, is if he wins, will the Saudis still be interested in bankrolling the fight? And even in that situation, I still think it could happen with or without them financing it because this is a fight that you can do in Liverpool, in a stadium, in Anfield, and sell it out. Think about it. If Callum Smith wins early next year, his stock will be at an all-time high. Having beaten the odds, having beaten the beast from the east, he will have the confidence to go into that Dimitri Bivol fight, and the fans will be behind him, him having beaten Artur Betterbeef to become this division's ring magazine lineal and unified champion, with only one puzzle piece missing. So even without the Saudis backing it, I think a fight between Dimitri and Callum it can still happen. It can happen in Liverpool. It can happen in Enfield. So if Callum beats Artur, the question is, can Callum beat Artur? You know, he's proven himself a destructive puncher in his own right in his last two starts with Lennon Castillo and Matthew Bowderleek, but those guys, they ain't got the firepower of an Artur better beef. They're not as aggressive. Oh. You can let your hands go with them because they can't give you as much to think about as an Artur Better Beef, and they don't apply pressure like an Artur Better Beef. Callum Smith doesn't seem to handle pressure well against shorter, stumpier fighters that make for a smaller target, like John Ryder, who arguably beat him, and Canelo, who definitely beat him. Looks like he struggles to manage the distance against shorter, stumpier fighters because he has to punch down to hit them. So tall with those long arms, it's actually a bit more difficult to fight a shorter fighter because it's a smaller target. Thus, that shorter, stumpier fighter that's barreling forward and applying pressure tends to be able to close the distance on him because he can't manage it as well against them. So even if this is a spicier fight and a dicier fight than this weekend's fight, even if it's not a four Gone conclusion, the outcome of the match, Artur still is the favorite. It's not a knock on Callum, but this guy is quite literally one of the biggest punchers, not just at light heavyweight, but in the sport. So that really left me with no choice. You know what I mean? Uh, this is a massive card that I can't say no to. Um, so they've stripped me, but um, it is what it is. You know what I mean? They can do what they want. I'll get the belts back. You know, all they've got to do is train hard, keep winning, and they'll come back to me. But how does it feel having to give it back? Because I know what it means to you to be a world champion. Yeah, it's bullshit. You know, it's fucking, it's not right, but it is the what it is. You know what I mean? We're not going to sit here and soak. We're going to get a job done on the 23rd of December. And then when that one's done, we're going to get another job done. And we continue to do that. And then... The belt will come back. They have to. It's Jai Opataya, who's now been stripped of the IBF title for non-compliance, oh. taking to his social media saying that all roads still go through me. And even if he doesn't have the red belt anymore, he still has the Ring Magazine title, and he is still this division's lineal cruiserweight champion. Don't forget... That's what he became when he beat Mayris Breedis. Mayris Breedis was lineal going into that fight with Jai well over a year ago. And oddly enough, this is all about Mayris Breedis not being Jai Opataya's next opponent. Mayris Breedis, who's injured and isn't available to fight anyway. You heard that right. Huh? 
IBF World Cruiserweight Champion Jai Opataya has decided to vacate his world title belt. The move comes before his scheduled December 23rd bout in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia against Britain's Ellis Zorro, with a mandatory challenge of Mayris Breedis currently unavailable due to injury. Opataya's team were hopeful that they would be able to defend the belt against Zorro. However, the IBF declared that Breedis must be Opataya's next opponent, despite the fact that Breedis' team had also agreed to a step-aside deal to let the Zorro bout take place while the former champion recovers and a deal in place to face Opataya in February. An appeal was sent to the IBF on behalf of Matchroom and Tasman Fighters, Queensbury Promotions and Vazerman Boxing, outlining that all parties involved were prepared to accommodate the proposed fight with Zorro, but this was denied. I fought through absolute agony to win that belt, and it saddens me to relinquish it, said Opataya. But the fact is, Breedis isn't ready to fight on December 23rd, and I need to stay active. I simply can't turn down a career-high payday. Belts should be won and lost in the ring. And I'm still a Ring Magazine champion, and all roads in the Cruiserweight division go through me. He continued, I am the true king of the Cruiserweight division, and I'll be defending that prestigious Ring Magazine title on December 23rd. I look forward to getting that IBF belt back as soon as possible and adding all of them, one by one. Opataya's manager, Mick Francis, continued, we respect the IBF's rules which are in place to protect the boxer in the mandatory position. However, this one was extremely bizarre circumstance where the mandatory boxer was actually happy huh? to not have it immediately enforced as he is injured. So make it make sense. Why would the IBF want to strip Jai Opataya to accommodate a fighter who can't fight him, accommodate a mandatory who's unavailable anyway? What the hell do the IBF get out of doing this? All Jai wants to do is keep busy. It's not like Mayris Breedis is available to fight him anyway. I said it before and I'll say it again. There's something else going on here. Somebody behind the scenes could be influencing the IBF through monetary means. To give Jai Opataya a hard time so that the title goes vacant and it can go to someone else without them having to fight him for it. Outside of a scenario like that, and I know that it sounds a lot like a conspiracy theory, but you tell me, what exactly does the IBF gain from doing this? You're doing this to accommodate a mandatory challenger who's unavailable to compete. Why would you want to strip Jai in that situation unless it's to give the belt to someone else? And you will notice that Mexico's own Gilberto Zerto Ramirez is ranked right behind Mayris Breedis. So what if they strip Jai, knowing Mayris Breedis can't fight so that they can skip right past Mayris Breedis over to Gilberto Zerto Ramirez to order a fight between him and someone else. Ranked right behind Zerto is Canada's own Ryan Rosicki, and I don't think Zerto has what it takes to beat Ryan Rosicki, not that it matters anyway, because Ryan just became the WBC's mandatory challenger, which may eliminate him from these ranks once they're updated. Ranked at number six is Poland's own Mikhail Sieslak, a capable fighter. Are they gonna order him to fight Zerto? Just get the sense that there's something else going on here, and depending on who ends up with that belt, That'll tell us what was going on. We'll find out.